Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Linus Pauling Institute's first webcast of 2021. My name is Alexander Michaels, and I'm a research, uh, research associate at the Linus Pauling Institute, where I've been involved in vitamin C research in, uh, for the last 20 years or so, um, and I will be your host for today's talk. We have an amazing turnout today for today's event. This is uh, Vitamin C and Health New Frontiers. Registrations went off the charts as soon as this webcast was announced and has been increasing steadily every day. Um, I think the last numbers we have is more than 1,200 people are registered for this webcast. And I can see uh, down below that more people are filing in at the moment as I'm talking. So I'll give everybody a moment to get in. Um, but uh, I think this is just a, a testament to how uh, amazing vitamin C research is and how much people really want to know about this molecule. Um, so big welcome to everyone. I'm glad you made it out here this Saturday to hear about the latest in vitamin C research. Uh, this virtual format's uh, great for us because we can reach so many people around the world um, who, who just want to know what we have to say and, and hear from our speakers. Um, we have four vitamin C experts with us today. Um, that's going, that are going to just be answering your questions for the most part. Um, let me start by acknowledging that this talk uh, on this day was uh, no coincidence. We are only one day away from Linus Pauling Day uh, in the state of Oregon. February 28th, 2021 will be the 120th birthday, 120th anniversary of Linus Pauling's birthday in Portland, Oregon. Um, and uh, the name stake behind the institution and his mission uh, for helping everywhere, everyone everywhere uh, achieve optimum health. So in honor of Dr. Pong's work with vitamin C, we pulled together uh, vitamin C experts to give an, an update on the latest research on this amazing molecule, as I said. But before I start introducing the speakers, I'd like to start by introducing our director of the Linus Pauling Institute, um, Dr. Emily Ho, um, whose camera is on with me right here. Um, this is Dr. Ho's first Linus Pauling Day as director, uh, but she's definitely been at the Institute through many a Linus Pauling Day before this. Um, and uh, I think, uh, Emily, you gave, a, you gave a talk for our Linus Pauling Day event last year, uh, if I remember correctly, and that was great. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I'll just let Emily take over and give us some perspective on today's event. Well, welcome everybody to the Lions Pauling Institute's annual Lions Pauling Day. Um, again, my name is Emily Ho, and I'm the current director of uh, the Lions Pauling Institute. Um, and as Alex mentioned, this is my first Lions Pauling Day, and we are doing things a little bit differently. Um, we are the day before Linus's birthday, um, and we're doing things remotely. But um, as was already mentioned, I'm really thrilled um, that we're able to reach so many of you with this uh, important message and this important information. Um, and really help share with you the inspiration of Dr. Linus Pauling, um, who's one of one of OSU's most famous uh, alumni. Um, he's won two unshared uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, one in chemistry and one in peace. Um, Pauling didn't win his Nobel Prizes for his work in vitamin C, but he certainly has had a huge and lasting impact on how the world views vitamin C um, and its impact on, on health. So as I mentioned, Linus Pauling really was, was a true innovator and not afraid to go against the norms. Um, and uh, very uh, early on began to research how high doses of vitamin C had dramatic effects on human health. Um, in 1970, he published the vitamin C and the common cold and then updated it in 1976 where he published this vitamin C, the common cold and the flu. Pauling is well known for coining the term orthomolecular medicine. Um, and to summarize, that concept really talks about um, the right molecule um, in the right concentration in the right place in the body. And vitamin C is one of the, the a perfect example of this concept. Um, in the late, mid to late 70s, uh, working uh, with uh, a surgeon in Scotland, Ewan, um, Ewan uh, Cameron, um, Pauling really envisioned new potentials for vitamin C um, to treat a whole host of different diseases and maladies, including cancer, skin disease, schizophrenia, common cold, and infections. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some modern updates with you uh, today. Uh, so later on in 1986, 
His New York Times bestseller, um, How to Live Longer and Feel Better was first published that really helps um, outline Pauling's concepts of taking uh, vitamins and minerals and how they are key to preventing disease and live a long life. Um, this work really helped revolutionize the way uh, that many of us think about nutrition and health. Um, and again, we're gonna bring you more of these updates of, of these concepts with our international panel of experts um, who will be introduced to you uh, shortly. So Linus Pauling was born in Portland, Oregon on February 28th, 1901. So again, tomorrow he'll be, he would have been 120 years old. Um, he went to the Oregon Agriculture, which is now known as Oregon State University, where he met his wife, um, Ava Helling. Uh, in, uh, after his death in 1994, Oregon's governor, uh, who at the time, Barbara Roberts, uh, recognized um, his remarkable achievements um, and named February 28th the first ever Linus Pauling Day. And today at the Institute, we celebrate this um, every, every year um, as we are doing today. Uh, it's also the 25th anniversary of the LPI at OSU. Um, so there's lots to celebrate. Um, but in today's celebration specifically, we're gonna honor the spirit of Linus Pauling, um, his spirit of innovation and his love for vitamin C by bringing you some of the world's experts on vitamin C and health. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back uh, to uh, Dr. Alex Michaels, uh, one of our own vitamin C uh, lovers at the Institute, um, and he'll be moderating our session for today. Thank you, Emily. Um, and that was a great and excellent background for why we're doing this all today. Um, and we, we just uh, love to talk about Dr. Pauling, but of course, this is not, this is not a webinar about Dr. Pauling. This is a webinar about vitamin C. So what I'm going to do right now is actually introduce one of our speakers to give us some background and, and kind of uh, a little vitamin C um, primer. Uh, we don't have time to go into a you know, full background primer on vitamin C. That would probably take a whole nother webinar to do so. And if you are interested in webinars about the basics about vitamin C, you can find uh, those kind of webinars on our homepage, lpi.oregonstate.edu or our YouTube page. Uh, but right now, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Anitra Carr. Um, Anitra and I have known each other for more than 20 years now. Uh, we met in the Linus Pauling Institute when I was a graduate student and she was a postdoc. She and Baltz Fry had just written some of the seminal review articles about um, vitamin C and health that helped set the newest or the latest RDAs in the United States. Um, after leaving the Institute, she went back uh, home to New Zealand, where she's now an associate professor at the University of Otago in Christchurch. But I'll let Anitra tell you the rest. Anitra. Thanks, Alex. So today, as Alex mentioned, I'll just give a very brief overview of vitamin C and health, but specifically focus on its roles in cancer and infection because of Linus Pauling's interest in those areas, and also as a way to introduce the areas of expertise of our panel members. So as Alex mentioned, uh, after I finished my PhD in New Zealand, I obtained an American Heart Association postdoctoral fellowship, which I carried out with uh, Professor Boltz Fry when he, not long after he'd been made the new director of the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University. So my research focus at the time was uh, looking at the role of vitamin C and potentially protecting against the development of cardiovascular disease. And as Alex also mentioned, we wrote a number of um, high impact papers around the role of vitamin C in human health and disease. And this one was submitted to the Institute of uh, the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institutes of Medicine during their review of the um, dietary intake recommendations for the antioxidant vitamins. And the recommended dietary intake of vitamin C was increased uh, one and a half fold from 60 to 90 milligrams a day in 2001. That year, I also had our first child and um, then, then took the next nine years out of my career to help um, raise, raise her and her uh, two siblings and they're all now teenagers. So in 2010, I returned to work at the University of Otago in Christchurch, New Zealand, and I carried out uh, human intervention studies investigating vitamin C bioavailability 
uh, and health effects, including around immunity and mood. And more recently, I set up my um, own research group and I've been investigating the use of intravenous vitamin C in patients with cancer, pneumonia and sepsis. And I'm also interested in the role of vitamin C in metabolic conditions such as diabetes and metabolic syndrome, which is also known as prediabetes. So why do we need vitamin C? So normally vitamin C is synthesized from glucose in plants and the livers of most animals, except humans and a handful of other animal species. And this is due to random genetic mutations that have occurred over our evolution that have resulted in a key enzyme in the biosynthetic pathway being knocked out. So we can no longer make vitamin C in our, or synthesize it in our livers. So what this means is that vitamin C is now vital for life and we must get it through our diet in order to survive. And the best sources of vitamin C are fresh fruit and vegetables. Vitamin C has numerous functions in the body. It's a uh, cofactor for a family of metalloenzymes, which have uh, numerous important uh, biosynthetic and regulatory roles in the body. For example, it's required for collagen protein structure, cellular energy production, hormone and neurotransmitter synthesis, and metabolic regulation. And recent research is indicating a role for vitamin C in epigenetic regulation. And this is a very exciting new area of research because it's indicating that vitamin C can help up and down regulate thousands of genes in our bodies. So as Emily mentioned, Linus Pauling is uh, well known for his work around vitamin C and cancer, having published the popular book, Cancer and Vitamin C in the late 1970s. In the mid-1970s, he carried out a study in 100 terminal cancer patients who had been treated with 10 grams a day of intravenous vitamin C for at least 10 days, and then 10 grams a day of oral vitamin C thereafter. And he reported that the patients who received vitamin C had much better survival than the control patients who didn't receive any vitamin C. And this was true for all cancer types, but in particular colon and breast cancer. So after he published the study, doctors at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona decided to carry out a couple of clinical trials to see if they could reproduce these findings. So in these studies, patients with advanced cancer were treated with 10 grams a day of oral vitamin C or a placebo tablet, which contains no vitamin C. In both of these studies, there was no differences in survival between the vitamin C and the placebo group. But has anyone noticed the differences between these studies and the original Pauling study? These studies used oral vitamin C only. The original Pauling study used intravenous vitamin C initially followed by oral. So this is where a lot of the uh, controversy around the use of vitamin C has and in cancer has come from uh, a lack of understanding of the differences between oral and intravenous vitamin C, because we now know there are large differences between the two. So this figure shows you the blood levels of vitamin C after oral or intravenous vitamin administration. You can see after oral administration, you just get this little blip in your blood. Can't get my um, mouse. Uh, whereas intravenous vitamin C bypasses the regulated intestinal uptake of oral vitamin C, which means you can get much higher blood levels following intravenous uh, administration. However, you can see that this high peak is still quite transient, and that's because vitamin C is water soluble, and so any excess that the body doesn't need is excreted quite rapidly by the kidneys, so it has a half-life in blood of only you know, less than two hours. Anyway, to put this into perspective, an infusion bag of vitamin C, uh, which can, typically contains about 70 grams of vitamin C uh, for patients with cancer these days, is equivalent to 1,000 orange, oranges, and that's why it needs to be administered intravenously. High-dose intravenous vitamin C is likely required or facilitates um, 
penetration of the vitamin into the, the core of solid tumors. So we've recently shown that the core of colorectal tumors is very low in vitamin C, as you can see by this red uh, area here. Following intravenous vitamin C administration to these patients, you can see much higher levels of vitamin C in the tumor, and this likely facilitates its anti-cancer activities. Other research has shown that people who have higher vitamin C levels in their uh, tumors have much better survival than, than people who have low levels of vitamin C in their tumors. And this data here is from patients with breast cancer, but similar trends are also observed with patients with colorectal cancer. So Jenny Drisco, who's on our panel, has had many years experience administering intravenous vitamin C to patients with cancer, and she's also been involved with a number of clinical trials, so she'll be able to answer many of your questions around these areas. So what is the connection between vitamin C and respiratory infection? It turns out that uh, serious respiratory infections such as pneumonia are a major complication of the vitamin C deficiency disease scurvy. And pneumonia is one of the major causes of death for people with scurvy. So this indicates a strong link between vitamin C insufficiency and infection. And we now know that vitamin C has numerous roles that support healthy immune function, including improving uh, the ability of white blood cells to eliminate pathogens from the body. Once again, it was Linus Pauling who stimulated an interest in the use of vitamin C for respiratory infections. You can see that not long after Pauling published his book, Vitamin C and the Common Cold in the early 1970s, there was a huge upsurge in clinical trials investigating the use of vitamin C in the common cold. This figure shows vitamin C levels in patients with severe uh, infections such as pneumonia and sepsis shown in the orange here. You can see their vitamin C levels are much lower than community dwelling cohorts, which are shown in the green bars. And if the patients go on to develop severe sepsis and end up in the intensive care unit, their levels are the lowest of all with many in the deficiency range. Critically ill patients also have much higher requirements for vitamin C than the general population. So normally 300 milligrams a day of vitamin C would be more than enough to saturate the, the blood of a, a healthy person. However, 10 times this amount or three grams a day is required to saturate the blood of critically ill people. And this is equivalent to 40 oranges a day. And so this is why uh, intravenous route is often chosen for these patients as well. So what about vitamin C and COVID? So the World Health Organization has highlighted vitamin C as a potential adjunctive therapy with biologic plausibility for the um, patients with severe COVID-19. So sepsis is a major complication of severe COVID. And this recent clinical trial carried out by Dr. Fowler has shown that septic patients who receive intravenous vitamin C have significantly decreased mortality compared to the patients who received placebo. And he can talk more about this uh, trial in a minute. Another recent trial carried out in Wuhan, China in patients with severe COVID has shown that the patients in the high dose intravenous vitamin C group also had significantly lower mortality than those in the placebo group. And there are now numerous trials running um, up and running around the world investigating vitamin C use for COVID-19. Dr. Fowler is an, an experienced intensive care physician and he'll be able to answer any questions you have about administration of intravenous vitamin C to patients with sepsis and COVID-19. So with respect to prevention of disease, you can see from this figure that there are a number of diseases that can be partially or almost fully avoided by healthy diet and lifestyle. These include colon cancer, stroke, coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes. And this is why the US government now recommends that half your plate should be fruit and vegetables. 
And this is because they contain numerous healthy nutrients such as vitamin C. With regard to vitamin C and diabetes, we found that uh, people with pre, both pre-diabetes and diabetes, uh, a much higher proportion of them have inadequate vitamin C status, which is shown by these yellow, orange and red bars. And this was um, despite them having a similar dietary intake of the vitamin as the healthy controls. So what this means is that the elevated oxidative stress and inflammation that's observed in diabetes is depleting the vitamin C levels in these people. And we know that diabetes is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And there've been a number of large epidemiological studies that have shown that higher levels of vitamin C are associated with lower mortality from cardiovascular disease. And this figure just shows data from uh, a large study of 20,000 uh, British adults. The people who had the highest levels of vitamin C in their blood, shown here, had a 60% decreased risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease compared to the people who had the lowest levels of vitamin C in their blood. Now this trend could just indicate vitamin C is acting as a marker for a healthy diet, but it does also have a lot of functions that help support healthy um, cardiovascular functioning. And Marit Traber has recently published a review around the roles of vitamin C and E in metabolic syndrome, which is a major risk factor for both diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So she'll better answer any questions you may have around this. And now I'm going to hand back to Alex, who will introduce the speakers in more detail. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Anitra, um, for that, that background. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to try to do this uh, quickly so we can actually get to the questions. Um, the, the questions, you know, we've already gotten plenty of questions um, from you guys during the registration process. You're still typing questions in as we speak. I'm going to... Um, and, uh, but if you haven't seen the question and answer button, you look below and it's Q and A and you can type your question in there and we are monitoring that during the talk. Um, but I'm gonna ask the rest of the speakers to turn on their uh, cameras uh, for the moment. And then I'm going to let each one of them talk about their work for, uh, for just a brief second before we get to the questions. Starting with uh, Dr. Jeannie Drisco, um, from, uh, Professor Emeritus from the, uh, uh, University of Kentucky Medical Center. Uh, Jeannie, if you want to. Uh... Yes, well, I'd like to thank the Linus Pauling Institute and the webinar planners for including me in this seminal gathering. I mean, it's really, really wonderful. But I'd like to give a special shout out to Dr. Emily Ho and Dr. Alex Michaels for putting together this gathering. You've done a wonderful job with this. Um, as uh, Alex said, I'm Jeannie Drisco. I'm currently a professor emeritus at the University of Kansas Medical Center and the former endowed professor, interestingly, of orthomolecular medicine and administrator of KU Integrative Medicine. So academic institutions like to see you uh, have the four pillars of academic medicine, and that is education, service, research, and clinic practice. Well, at KU Integrative Medicine, we fulfilled this mandate by providing education in integrative medicine to all types of students, a fellowship in integrative medicine, and education of postdocs in integrative medicine basic science. So uh, KU Integrative Medicine also served both of our academic uh, communities through committee work, but also the state of Kansas at the Board of Healing Arts around the topic of integrative medicine and the nation by sitting on various committees and review boards. We also had a very robust clinic practice and you'd probably not be surprised to know we included IV vitamin C in our treatment of patients with chronic complex illness. So we used IV vitamin C in cancer patients acute and chronic viral infections, acute and chronic bacterial infections, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and environmental toxicity, including mold and mold mycotoxin toxicity. And here's a picture of my colleague and scientific partner, Dr. Kay Chin in the front. And she's with her students and her postdoc 
in this picture. Dr. Chen was a postdoc under Mark Levine in his lab at the NIH, who many of you have uh, heard of. And at, at this, um, at, during her time as a postdoc, she conducted basic science research in high-dose IV vitamin C. But what Kay and I are most known for is our translational research. And that is uh, the combination of basic science research with research in patients in the clinic. And most people think of us as translational researchers around the topic of cancer. And of course we are, um, currently we have a study in uh, patients with bladder cancer using IV vitamin C. But important for this discussion, we're now looking at IVC, intravenous vitamin C for SARS-CoV-2 the virus that causes COVID-19 by studying it in a viral cell tissue model and an animal model. And this research is ongoing. We are excited to provide this basic science research information in coronavirus that will certainly extend to other viral infections as well. I can't give you really results as of yet, but I can tell you that the current IV doses used in recent clinical trials are likely not adequate as an antiviral agent. So more information to follow. Next slide now, Alex, thanks. Today, we're going to be discussing both oral and intravenous vitamin C. And I want to make it very clear that they act very differently in the body. As Dr. Carr has shown with her work, oral vitamin C, <clears throat> excuse me, is a very powerful vitamin with many important properties. Different people during different stages of health need different doses of oral vitamin C as she's shown. Healthy adults on the left with a good diet are in the green zone requiring only minimal supplementation of vitamin C but with aging, illness, and or poor diets, our requirements for oral vitamin C increase, as I well know as now moving into my retirement phase. <laughs> we then come to the primary divide, that red bolt down the middle. And that's when we cross over from oral vitamin C to intravenous vitamin C. This is a big divide, and no amount of oral vitamin C can be given to be equivalent to intravenous vitamin C. Oral vitamin C gives us blood levels in the micromolar ranges, while intravenous vitamin C gives us blood levels in the millimolar ranges. This is a thousand fold greater concentration in the blood. It's like trying to jump from one side of the Grand Canyon to the other, for example, it's impossible. So something happens when vitamin C is given in the vein and it bypasses the gut absorption as Dr. Carr showed you. IV vitamin C becomes a drug. And though it may retain its vitamin properties, it now becomes a pro-oxidant when it enters the space around the cells. And through a chemical reaction called Fenton chemistry, it reacts to become hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is the end drug and vitamin C is the pro-drug in this case. We and we have shown this in our research and has now been replicated multiple times around the world. It is the production of hydrogen peroxide that makes the secondary divide. So if you see off to the right, you start be, is looking at patients that become ill and maybe come to the clinic like our patients or hospitalized or at worst in the ICU. So that second divide is a division between the low dose IV vitamin C and the high dose side of IV vitamin C. And this is where it really becomes, it really is doing its job as an antiviral or antibacterial drug when it crosses the secondary divide. So significant hydrogen peroxide is not formed under approximately 10 grams. So IV doses under 10 grams are low dose IV vitamin C, not high dose IV vitamin C. While doses above this range, even up to 100 grams, produce significant hydrogen peroxide. And again, our research has shown that increasing doses of IVC result in increasing blood levels that 
will become hydrogen peroxide in that space around the cells. It's a linear response. The higher the dose of IVC, the higher the production of hydrogen peroxide. And I, I guess an analogy would be to think of it like vancomycin antibiotic. So let's say you need to give a gram of vancomycin every eight hours for methicillin resistant staph, uh, staph aureus or MRSA. If you only give one milligram, for example, you will not be able to get an adequate blood level to fight MRSA. This doesn't mean that the vancomycin is an ineffective antibiotic. It only means that the wrong dose was given. Therefore, you can think of IV vitamin C in the same way. The dose is critical and it has to be given on that right side of the secondary divide or it is an ineffective anti-infective agent. We have also shown in our research that the infusion rate is critical and it should be given at 0.5 to one gram per minute. That means a 50 gram dose could be given over one to two hours and we also have shown in our research, this is very safe, given the fact that a patient has a normal G6PD enzyme, adequate kidney function, and no history of oxalate kidney stones. And we have given thousands of doses safely, both in research project and in our clinical practice. So while IV vitamin C fixes scurvy in these ill patients, it is our hypothesis that the higher dose produces hydrogen peroxide, which results in an anti-infective and anti-cancer agent. Next slide. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jeannie, for that, for that introduction. Actually, you, you've pretty much set up uh, our next speaker pretty, pretty well. Uh, so I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Fowler, uh, Barry Fowler, to take the stage and, and talk about his work with sepsis. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. You can hear me, okay. Um, thank you all. I want to tell you how excited I am to be part of this webinar today and also honored to have been asked to present here today. Um, as Dr. Carr um, and Dr. Driscoll mentioned, during critical illness, plasma vitamin C levels drop to very, very low levels. And in our initial clinical research, we found that patients with severe sepsis had near scurvy levels of plasma ascorbic acid. And um, in the years of basic research that we did with an animal model of sepsis, we found that vitamin C could be very effective when administered intravenously as Dr. Carr and Dr. Uh, Drisco have mentioned. Um, and, and so we put together uh, an application to the NIH. The NIH sponsored us for a um, phase two proof of concept trial that we entitled vitamin C infusion for treatment in sepsis induced acute lung injury or the citrus ALI trial. Um, we had seven medical centers between VCU, Cleveland Clinic, Medical College of Wisconsin, University of Kentucky, and Emory University uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, participating and enrolling patients in this trial. Uh, next slide. We screened 1,262 subjects. Uh, because of our elimination criteria, we eliminated and excluded 1,092 subjects and randomized 170 patients for this trial. We found uh, and we uh, enrolled 83 placebo patients who were receiving standard of care for sepsis and acute respiratory failure by mechanical ventilation. One patient was excluded prior to receiving vitamin C who had a problem called acute eosinophil pneumonia that presents very similar to ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that patient was excluded. And on the vitamin C group, which was 84 patients, we excluded two patients who were uh, leukemic patients that were suffering from 
diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, which also looks very exactly like sepsis-induced acute lung injury or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and that was 84 patients who received vitamin C and the same standard of care that the placebo patients got. Next slide. The vitamin C group received 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight every six hours for 96 hours. This was close to what Dr. Risco was mentioning. Uh, each uh, patient received approximately 15 grams of intravenous vitamin C over the course of 24 hours, but they received it somewhere around 3,500 to 5,000 milligrams every six hours infused uh, 50 mLs of dextrose 5% in water over a 30 minute period. Next slide. We were very interested to determine how vitamin C could protect the organs that fail, especially in sepsis. And we used what is called the SOFA score, which allows a broad um, assessment of organ failure. The SOFA score is an abbreviation for Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score. And it allows us to look at uh, the organs that I've listed here. Next slide. The, um, over the course of the five years that we were conducting this, we found that the clinicians who were caring for the ICU patients in the trial did not often order hepatic function studies. So we had to eliminate liver function uh, in the trial. And so what we published was a modified SOFA score, which in the literature has been found to be legitimate, uh, the modified SOFA score. Next slide. And as Dr. Carr mentioned, over the course of um, the time that we were infusing these patients, every six hours for 96 hours, if you look at the orange column on the left, the blue line represents the placebo patients. And over 96 hours, 19 placebo patients died versus only four patients who were receiving vitamin C died. And when we looked at the cross section between um, the patients who were placebo patients and the patients who received vitamin C, there was no difference in the male-female ratio or the age. Interestingly, however, if you look at what occurred after the vitamin C treatment, you saw the mortality that we were reducing over 96 hours in the vitamin C treatment group began to rise and essentially parallel that that was gotten in the placebo. Uh, next slide. And so in the placebo patients, we found that 46% of those patients, these were septic individuals who were in acute respiratory failure had died versus, next slide, only 30% of patients receiving vitamin C and this was significant at 28 days. And you can see the level of significance um, of P equals 0 0.01. The important thing to mention here, and Dr. Carr and Dr. Drisco mentioned this, by giving patients who are critically ill 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight every six hours, we took the plasma vitamin C levels as high as five or six millimolar. Uh, versus at the onset of the vitamin C treatment, which were patients that were approximately 18 micromolar. And so we were able to increase the vitamin C levels by over 6,000 um, micrograms per mil. Next slide. Um, the important piece of this research and what every critical care doctor has been anxious to find is a therapy that can reduce mortality. And organ failure is directly related to mortality. And what you have in this graphic shows you that vitamin C 
effectively and significantly reduced organ failure of the sequential organ failure assessment score. Next slide. And we published this, as you can see below, in JAMA um, in 2020. Um, and feel that it's important for clinicians around the world to consider this. We are now working with the Prevention and Early Treatment of Acute Lung Injury Network, the so-called PEDAL network, to perform a much larger trial using vitamin C in patients with sepsis. Uh, and has been mentioned by the previous two speakers, vitamin C is being actively investigated around the world. Uh, in patients with sepsis. And also I might add, we at Virginia Commonwealth University are also conducting a randomized double-blind trial using the same dosage, the VCU protocol, we call it, in patients with COVID pneumonia. And that is ongoing. And we are enrolling as we speak at Virginia Commonwealth University. We now have over 140 COVID positive pneumonia patients. Uh, in the hospital at Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. Yeah, and uh, when I heard about you enrolling uh, COVID patients, I knew I had to get you on the panel, <laughs> Dr. Fowler. Um, uh, thank you for that for the intro, and I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly turn it over to Dr. Murad Traber, who's actually uh, from the Linus Pauling Institute, and. Um, while uh, her work doesn't always focus on vitamin C, uh, she definitely has vitamin C peppered in there every once in a while. Uh, Marette? Thank you very much, Alex. So it's a real pleasure to be on the stage with such illustrious vitamin C investigators. I want to emphasize that I'm so pleased to be named the Ava Helen Pauling Chair. And so this is a real honor for me to speak at a, a Linus Pauling Day. What I'd like to talk about is healthy people. And um, you might all be wondering, what is metabolic syndrome? Well, it is a disorder of healthy people who are, perhaps you've heard of obese, um, have hypertension, have hyperlipidemia, maybe even the beginnings of type 2 diabetes. It's a formula that says, well, maybe you are edging yourself into danger. And I'd like to emphasize this because if you think about all of those risk factors that are what are likely to make you more likely to have very severe uh, reactions to COVID-19, it really speaks to diet is important, not only for chronic disease, but also your immune function and your resistance to disease. And I was very taken with Dr. Drisco's picture that the green to the red zone. And if you're over there in the green zone, does that really protect you? Are you prevented from getting sick? And if you look at chronic, chronic disease numbers, the answers are yes. Eating huge amounts and literally five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables every day is what I as a nutritionist would like to encourage you to do. So what am I talking about metabolic syndrome for? Uh, Alex, if I could have the next slide. Um, it turns out that my favorite vitamin, vitamin E, when it does its job protecting you from lipid peroxidation, it turns vitamin E into a radical. And you may remember that vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin. That fat-soluble vitamin sits in membranes, not where vitamin C is, but the radical pushes vitamin E out there into that aqueous phase where vitamin C is necessary to reduce it. So when you have an infection and increased oxidative damage, you are creating more <clears throat> excuse me, creating more radicals that you need these two antioxidant vitamins to work hand in hand to protect you. And if we go to the next slide, what it turns out is metabolic syndrome probably is afflicting more than 35% of American adults. 
it increases the risk of life-threatening diseases. These are mostly chronic diseases, but I think we're gonna probably see in the upcoming years that probably also increasing the risk of serious COVID. And so we've been interested in metabolic syndrome in collaboration with Rich Bruno at the Ohio State University. We studied people with metabolic syndrome. What we found is they have low vitamin C status. So exactly what Dr. Drisco was talking about, they've slipped out of the green zone into the yellow zone. Is that because they have more oxidative stress? Is that because they eat fewer fruits and vegetables? They have poor vitamin C intake? Probably so. But what we also found is they have increased endotoxemia. So they are already on the way and primed for getting sepsis. And you just heard how dangerous sepsis is and how those patients come into the hospital with exceedingly low vitamin C levels. Well, we found out that that low vitamin C also makes low vitamin E. And so this whole idea of these interactions is demonstrable. And we'd like to encourage everybody. You don't need IV vitamin C if you are a normal, healthy person. What you need is lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, maybe you should skip that steak and red meat and salami and go for fish go for fiber, and especially go for exercise. So on that message for healthy people, um, I'd like to uh, turn it back over to Alex. Okay, uh, thank you, Marette. Um, so at this point, we're actually gonna start the question and answer session um, after, um, and I think what I'm gonna do is, is follow up with, with our number one question actually is, uh, as a vitamin C researcher, the first question I'm always asked is, how much should I be taking? And uh, I'm going to start uh, with Anitra on that one. I think, uh, Anitra, do you want to you try tackling the how much should I be taking question? Uh, very good question. And as the speakers have pointed out, the amount to take depends on your state of health. So healthy people, uh, Mark Levine has done pharmacokinetic studies where he's given increasing doses of vitamin C to healthy people and shown that doses of 200 milligrams a day and upwards will saturate the blood of healthy people. So um, I would recommend taking at least 200 milligrams a day. Most of us take more than that because it's very hard to get supplements that are um, less than 500 milligrams a day. So those of us who take supplements, we're generally taking at least 500 a day, um, which is fine because you know we our bodies will take what they need and excrete the rest. So at least 200 a day, you can get that from five to nine servings of fruit and vegetables, as long as at least um, one or two of those are high vitamin C foods, because fruit and vegetables actually have, can have quite different levels of vitamin C in them. Bananas and apples are low in vitamin C. Oranges and kiwi fruit are high in vitamin C. So try and include high vitamin C foods in your diet if possible. And of course, if you're you're cooking those sources of uh, vitamin C, it reduces the amount of vitamin C in them. Yes. Um, uh, the Lyons Pauling Institute does recommend 400 milligrams of vitamin C a day, and it's partially because of that that wiggle room we don't really know about. You mentioned Dr. Levine's studies uh, in healthy people. Um, and so we don't know what's going on in, in people who are sick. Um, I'm going to actually just uh, push the question on to Dr. Drisco, if, if uh, you would like to make a comment. What, what do you say when people ask you how much vitamin C you should be taking? Fortunate to be able. Oh, you're, you're good. Yeah. Okay. I was fortunate to be able to measure vitamin levels in patients. And I, I do want to mention that measuring vitamin C levels in patients is really, really difficult. If you have a doctor that or a practitioner is going to measure your vitamin C level and they send you to the lab to do it or they draw the blood in their clinic and send it over to the lab, it's probably not going to be done correctly. 
it's something that's called a critical frozen. And this doesn't go for the other vitamins. This goes for vitamin C. It's a critical frozen. As soon as you draw that sample, it has to be immediately processed because vitamin C degrades so quickly in liquids, in lab specimens, whatever. So it has to be measured immediately. So if we were able to measure vitamin C, we were able to give advice based on the patient's need. And again, as it's been clearly shown today, different people at different stages need different amounts. So um, personally, <laughs> because um, um, I, I'm aging and I, uh, I take a little bit more vitamin C, and I think the good recommendation is to go up to bowel tolerance. So whatever you can take without upsetting your GI tract is probably a good dose for you at that time. And of course that changes day to day, and illness to illness. As Alex, you said, we, we often need more when we're ill. And um, so that's how I usually respond. It's fair. Um... Dr. Fowler, do you do you uh, have a, a standard answer when when someone asks you how much vitamin um, C? Well, I always and I, I think I have to agree with Anitra. Um, I have a huge respiratory clinic, and I'm always dealing with infection, especially in people with underlying lung disease, especially during cold weather, even outside of the coronavirus. And so I always advise them to take 500 milligrams twice daily of a product called Ester C. And Ester C is formulated so that it does not upset your stomach. Uh, there are other preparations out there on the market of buffered vitamin C, but I have and personally take 500 milligrams twice a day. Um, and as uh, Jeannie just mentioned, we have measured vitamin C in our laboratory personnel. And exactly what she said, we take vitamin C immediately and plunge it, plunge a little purple top tube into ice water. That's taken directly into the laboratory, centrifuged, and we add a reducing agent that prevents it from being oxidized. And when we did that, we showed those high levels that I mentioned earlier. And when we did this on uh, laboratory personnel, taking uh, those levels of vitamin C 500 twice a day, we routinely got 250 micrograms of plasma vitamin C. Excellent, yeah, definitely know the, the, the challenges to accurately measuring vitamin C uh, levels in, in anything. Uh, as I've been doing that for about 20 years now myself. Um, uh, Marette, uh, I know you, you say, you know, you should be getting vitamin C from the fruits and vegetables that you eat. Uh, it, when we get to about 400 milligrams or so, it does get a little harder though to get that, that, uh, that amount of fruits and vegetables unless you're eating a lot of tropical fruits. Well, and I would like to emphasize, I'm talking about normal, healthy people. So we're talking about people who don't have current disease, who want to improve their health by improving their diet. And I, I think the idea of we're, we're not that smart in nutrition yet. Uh, we're still waffling over saturated fat and cholesterol. And what is absolutely clear is you live longer if you eat the diet I'm talking about, lots of fruits and vegetables, fish, fiber, and for God's sakes, if exercise were a pill, <laughs> uh, we would be so rich recommending taking 30 minutes of exercise every day. So being a, a, a COVID captive in my house, that's what I've done. And hey, I feel healthier because of it. And of course, you know, uh, there's so much more in fruits and vegetables than just vitamin C, as you mentioned. I mean, all the vitamins, all the minerals, fiber. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to take supplemental vitamin C, just do it on top of all those fruits and vegetables. Um, so, so okay, I'm going to switch the topic slightly. Um, we, we, Dr. Fowler mentioned it just a moment ago. Uh, supplemental forms 
is uh, something that we we talk about a lot. Ester C is of course one that's that's a little buffered, helps with stomach, but one we get a question about a lot is liposomal vitamin C. And so, if for anyone who doesn't know, liposomal is is uh, lipid encapsulated uh, vitamin C, um, kind of lipid droplets with. With vitamin C in the center. Um, and I'm going to start with Dr. Drisco on this one. Um, what do you think about liposomal C? <laughs> well, I, I have a very passionate answer about this because uh, I'll, if you read some of the, the lay books, it'll tell you that you can take liposomal vitamin C and it'll be equivalent to getting IV vitamin C. And that is not accurate. Liposomal vitamin C perhaps is absorbed a bit better out of the GI tract and gives you a little bit better blood level than, let's say, a typical tablet of uh, l ascorbic acid of vitamin C, but um, it's still in the micromolar ranges. So it's that jumping over the one edge of the Grand Canyon to the next. You can't do it with liposomal vitamin C. It's a good form. It does increase your blood level somewhat, but it's not the answer to replacing IV vitamin C. Perfectly fair. Uh, Dr. Carr, Anitra, you, you have a follow-up on that? Uh, yes, I agree with um, Dr. Drisco. There's not huge differences between the two forms. Um, and I think the thing to remember is that the body, because we absolutely need vitamin C in our diet, our body is very well designed um, at taking vitamin C up from food or tablets, whatever the source, it will get the vitamin C that it needs. And so we've done studies where we've directly compared food sources of vitamin C with tablets and we've found exactly the same bioavailability, uh, which means we're taking up the vitamin C the same amount, regardless of whether it's with food, in food, um, as a tablet. So I think... Um, just trust the body. It, you give it, you know, give it enough, and the body will take what it needs, regardless of the source. Yes, I totally remember your studies with uh, the kiwi kiwi fruit studies. Those are great. Uh, um, I, I love those. Um, so I'm going to just pause for a moment here. We. We're at the top of the hour. It's now noon. Um, we, we don't want to terminate the broadcast now, but we understand if people need to go. Uh, we only really scheduled this for an hour, but we'd like to um, extend out another 20 minutes or so just to give more time for questions and, and answers from our panelists. Uh, and with that, I'm going to continue. Um, I think I might as well just go for the elephant in the room at this point. Um, let's talk about COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm going to start with Dr. Fowler again on this one. Um, what do you think about, I mean, obviously you've got a trial going on right now. Um, what do you think the, the role of vitamin C is going to be in COVID-19? Um, thank you. Thank you very much for asking that. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, COVID pneumonia, which is viral infection of the airways, um, produces an inflammatory response, in fact, a very severe inflammatory response that is similar to sepsis. And in my experience working with critical care doctors here at VCU, um, viral sepsis prevent, presents very much like bacterial sepsis. And the extent of inflammation in the lung of patients suffering from viral pneumonia from, COVID, from the coronavirus. It's very similar to bacterial ARDS, acute re induced acute respiratory failure. And in our work, um, and I'm sure many of the panelists are familiar with the work we've done in the past 10 years, we showed that vitamin C very effectively, once you get these high blood levels, acts as an interventional anti-inflammatory drug. And in our studies of sepsis-induced ARDS, we showed that vitamin C is successful because first of all, it lowers the explosion of cell-free DNA in the circulation, which is characteristic of acute inflammation. And the other thing we have shown is that vitamin C in these high plasma levels actually prevents vascular injury. 
And that is what is happening in COVID pneumonia, is intense vascular injury of the lung. And by giving high doses of vitamin C, we have shown that it's anti-inflammatory in bacterial sepsis. And we have some sneaking suspicion that patients that are getting vitamin C in our trial, even though we're blinded, we have, interestingly, some patients who are recovering quickly and other patients who are going on to die. And so I, I think for COVID pneumonia, vitamin C in these high blood levels, and I'm talking blood levels that are in the five to six millimolar range, as Dr. Drisco mentioned, is effectively anti-inflammatory and that it, it calms down the inflammation, which unfortunately in many of these patients is leading to early pulmonary fibrosis in patients who do survive mechanical ventilation of 20 days or so. Uh, same question to you, Dr. Drisco. Um, I, I, you and I chatted briefly at the beginning of the pandemic about uh, the stories coming out of China, um, mm -hmm. IV vitamin C uh, and, 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 and COVID-19 cases. Um, any, any follow up on that? Well, we had, um, we were able to help in another hospital in Wuhan uh, with uh, several of their patients in the ICU. And it's a case report and we're getting this published now. But when we, these patients were severely infected and not expected to survive. And when we used intravenous vitamin C at doses between 25 and 50 grams infused uh, over um, <clears throat> a very short period of time, as I mentioned, maybe an hour, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, patients actually uh, survived and were able to be discharged. So that intrigued us significantly. And when we heard Dr. Zhang's reports uh, about his patient, his trial, that he treated patients with higher doses as well, um, we decided that what we needed now were uh, the viral cell tissue work and the animal studies. So that's why we got funding to start those studies and they're underway now. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to Anika just for a moment, but, but uh, kind of change the question just a little bit, because um, I know you've written a lot uh, or a good review on, on the possible roles of vitamin C and COVID-19. Um, there's a recent paper on oral dosing of vitamin C during uh, COVID, and it didn't look good. Do you have any comments on that one? Uh, yes, this was a study carried out in Cleveland Clinic. I believe that's the one you're talking yep, about. And they also had an arm um, where the patients were given zinc and zinc and vitamin C combination. And uh, the dose of vitamin C they used in that study was eight grams a day oral. And they said to divide it into two or three doses a day. So potentially four grams twice a day. And we know that, you know, large doses like that aren't very, you know, adequately taken up into the body because the, the transporters in our gut are saturable. So they can only take up a certain amount of vitamin C, you know, over a certain time period. And earlier trials carried out in the common cold were more effective if the vitamin C was given more regularly. So on an hourly basis, for example, smaller doses spread out over the whole day. This trial nevertheless did show um, a, a shortening of the symptoms. So mm -hmm. there was about um, 1.2 days shorter symptoms in the patients who received vitamin C uh, versus the uh, patients who just received standard of care. Uh, this wasn't statistically significant because they actually stopped the trial early because they thought it wasn't, you know, they said it's not effective. But in reality, um, you know, it did show an effect. So I think if the trial had been designed better, there were a number of design issues with that trial. We might have seen, you know, even more dramatic results. And that's, that's a typical problem we see with uh, vitamin C studies in general. I mean, just or study design or, or studies that are, are uh, terminated early um, just because of various, but, but ways to, is, from our perspective, those would be very statistically under 
Howard studies. Uh, and so you can't really say anything, yet they get big headlines uh, saying vitamin C doesn't do anything in COVID-19. And I think that's uh, a mistake uh, to some degree. Um, and now, so some of it is like setting yourself up for success before the infection. Marat, you, you kind of talked about that, you know, uh, getting your immune system primed. Um, any, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've been following the, the vitamin C and COVID uh, literature, <laughs> but, you know, it, it does make sense, right? Well, it makes sense to me. I think uh, Mark Levine's name has already been mentioned a couple of times in this uh, little symposium, but uh, I'd like to remind everybody that the RDA for vitamin C was actually set based on Mark Levine's data showing that vitamin C can saturate white blood cells. And remember, white blood cells kill bacteria by spitting out bleach. And we all heard the horror story from the Trump administration, but the idea is that it actually works in vivo. And I wonder how much vitamin C is actually protecting white blood cells. And that's where I, I think it's a reasonable assumption that if you eat a good diet, if you have these, um, tendencies towards having more difficulties if you got an infection, taking vitamin C makes sense to me to protect yourself. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the immune system works through free radical mechanisms and nothing better to, to help you resist those free radicals than antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E, of course. Um, don't want to forget that. And I guess that, that brings up another question that somebody, uh, uh, asked in the crowd. Um, what about interactions? I mean, you know, we got vitamin C and vitamin E. Um, are there any other interactions that we should be paying attention to uh, in the body? Well, uh, I think I've become the goddess of interactions. We <laughs> not only uh, are interested in vitamin C, vitamin E, glutathione, the production of energy metabolism, so the mitochondria. I'll throw in phosphatidylcholine, phospholipids, the membrane. Um, now I can trace that to folic acid and um, we've been studying those kinds of interactions in the developing zebrafish embryo. And it seems like vitamin E is key to making all of those interactions feasible and possible. So if we had another week or so, I could explain the whole thing to you, but um, thanks for asking. Well, well, we'll get you in a webinar sometime soon, Rhett. <laughs> um, and, and of course, as uh, Dr. Carr mentioned, you know, zinc, uh, there's a zinc, you know, zinc is a support for the um, antioxidant uh, network as well. So we can't forget that. Um, you know, uh, we also know that vitamin C has interactions with iron uh, and copper, uh, especially if you're talking about bioavailability. Iron, uh, actually vitamin C helps the bioavailability Ability of iron. Um, and so a lot of people take them together when they need more iron. I think it's a caution that if you don't need the iron, it might not be a great idea. Um, so I think I, I'm actually going to turn back to recent headlines again, because uh, just the other day, and just as we were planning this, this webinar, um, a new article came out on sepsis. And so I'm going to, I'm going to open the mic up for Dr. Fowler. Uh, did you see that that recent uh, result with vitamin C and sepsis? Uh, no. Um, what? In which one are you referring? Oh, it, it is another uh, JAMA article that basically said that. Uh, um, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right, so let me let me address that. Um, that was the Victus trial, Victus. which um, which studied intravenous vitamin C at 1.5 grams given four times a day, way less than what we gave. Also thiamine, 200 milligrams per day, combined with hydrocortisone at 50 milligrams four times a day. And that would be 200 milligrams. And I was part of this trial. 
Um, and so I'm an author on the paper. And that low level of vitamin C did not save lives, did not reduce organ failure, did not reduce the time of vasopressor support or time on ventilator or time in ICU. And there was some criticism because the trial was privately funded. And uh, after 500 patients had been enrolled, the funder pulled support that had been targeting 2,000 patients. And so some of the argument was that statistically, um, we didn't see our outcomes because we weren't able to enroll the number of patients. Um, but I think what we have learned today in this conversation, when you're treating critically ill patients, the, all of the biological reactions that are so revved up that are injuring organs, it can't be treated by 1.5 grams of vitamin C. It has to be treated with large doses and it probably starts at about 15 grams intravenously and Dr. Drisco has much more experience in, in, in giving higher doses of intravenous vitamin C. And I think that's where studying sepsis needs to go. The, the study that I mentioned that's probably coming up within the next year on the pedal network will use the, the VCU protocol for giving vitamin C. It's good to know. Dose matters. Um, Dr. Drisco, I see you nodding your head. Let's, let's, uh, Let's get your take on this. I mean, definitely dose matters when it comes to sepsis, but also cancer. Yes, absolutely. And I think probably what people need to understand in all of this is that um, there really is not a negative effect that occurs at these higher doses. We've done a pharmacokinetic study with increasing doses of intravenous vitamin C that we were getting ready for publication and we started at one gram to 100 grams IV in patient, healthy patients. And then we studied 25, 50, 75, and 100 grams in cancer patients no longer getting therapy. And what we found was there isn't a maximal tolerated dose. 100 grams was well tolerated and it, it still had an effect. So likely we could even go higher. And we saw no organ damage we saw uh, there's often a, um, a, a medical myth is what I call it, that uh, there's increased bleeding with these high doses of IV vitamin C. There was no change in bleeding factors and we measured three or four different bleeding factors, no change, no bleeding. There was not kidney damage. The uh, kidney function remained normal from baseline to the following day. And some of those patients came back for four repeated doses weeks a week apart to confirm what we found. So uh, there was, and there's no injury to the red blood cell um, and uh, the uh, calcium levels may have shifted a little bit at the high. What, what happens is with the higher doses of IV vitamin C, when you even put it in plain water, it has what's called a high osmolality. It's like a salt water, too salty water, for example. And at those high osmolar doses, we found there was a little bit of calcium shift, but not significant, significant calcium drop. So that's another medical myth that's been out there that you can't give high dose IV vitamin C without putting calcium in the bag. Well, that's not accurate. So there's a lot of misunderstanding and misuse of IV vitamin C and some of the people that are not giving the proper doses, as Dr. Fowler mentioned, are poisoning our uh, research agenda, is essentially. Um, that that uh, so before you mentioned, you know, you were screening for kidney stone, you know, people with uh, kidney stone uh, problems mm -hmm. before giving IV. How how and a lot of people have asked, how real is this kidney stone risk? Um, it, it's only in people, and so what. I want to back up. We screen patients for this pharmacokinetic study with a 24 hour urine to look for oxalate mm -hmm. production in the urine. And those patients that had very high oxalate levels that were excluded from our trial had had oxalate kidney stones. So we never in our clinic practice ever gave 
IV vitamin C to anyone that had a history of oxalate kidney stones. And if a patient didn't know they, what kind of stone they had, we erred on the side of caution. Sure, sure. Um, I'll, I'll throw that to Dr. Carr, actually, when it comes to oral vitamin C. Is that, you know, an, a, uh, a concern that most people should have? I mean, if, they're, if they're, they haven't had a history of kidney stone formation. No, um, I, I, I personally don't think it's a concern. Um, and I, I haven't done oral vitamin C research, but uh, Dr. Carr has, but it should not, it would be like eating your fruits and vegetables. And you may, there may be some people, there's many reasons why kidney stones form, <laughs> but um, it, the oral vitamin C would be no different than eating a healthy plate full of fruits and vegetables. And there's okay. another thing I oh. wanna mention, I'm sorry, I, I have to say this, Recently in the literature, there was a paper by Dr. Merrick, who is running, who had really run the Victus trial and was using the 1.5 gram IV dose. I, I'd like to say that he's mentioned that you don't need to check G6PD enzyme. He, he has that in the literature. And the G6PD enzyme, maybe at one gram dose is not a, an important enzyme to check. But as you get higher in your doses of vitamin C by in the vein, you're going, if you don't have that G6PD enzyme, you're going to have a risk of breaking down red blood cells. And I have seen this, I have actually helped um, several uh, boards of healing art look at patients that have had massive hemolysis, lost blood, because they had G6PD deficiency and got high dose IV vitamin C. So it has, it, it has to be checked before a high dose IV vitamin C is given. So I'll be quiet now. Yes, definitely. You know, every, anyone who's giving you intravenous vitamin C should be screening you for risks before doing this. I mean, you don't trust a medical practitioner who doesn't do these screenings. Uh, but Anitra, I'll, I'll, I'll throw the question to you about, you know, safety. Um, you know, when it comes to oral, is there people, do people have to be concerned? Um, I don't believe so. If you have healthy kidney function, there should be no issues regardless of your oral intake. Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard of any, yeah, any issues with, with oral. It's mostly just the high dose intravenous if you already have a pre-existing uh, risk. Yeah, I mean, there were a few papers that looked at, but they were kind of um, weak, there's, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of a, a lot of these are just um, association papers. So they they look at someone's vitamin C intake and 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 look at their later kidney function, uh, later oxalate stone function, and see an association. This does not prove a cause and effect. There's so many other factors that can um, increase someone's risk for these um, stones, such as dehydration. Um, dietary intake, you can get it, get it from other foods and vegetables, cause high oxalate as well. It's not just vitamin C breakdown. Um, so as you say, those papers are very weak, but they are the ones that are picked up by the media and the doctors, unfortunately. And I, I, my last question, I, unfortunately, we're running out of time. You know, so many questions, not enough time to answer them all. But I think what I'm going to ask is uh, something that, that uh, Barry touched on briefly, which was funding, you know, funding for trials is, is difficult. Do you have any, Anitra, I'll start with you since you're on screen. Um, how hard is it to get money for vitamin C research right now? It's very hard. <laughs> Always has been. That hasn't changed. Although, you know, with, with every trial that's published, um, this helps, helps our argument um, for doing, you know, vitamin C research. In the past, you know, there's been a lot of misunderstanding around the importance of vitamin C and its roles and functions in the body. But all the recent research showing these new mechanisms that are acting in the body, the epigenetic mechanisms, the um, regulation of gene transcription, this is all pointing towards um, mechanistic rationales for how vitamin C can work in different diseases. And so we can target our trials better um, based on all the information that we're gathering. Every, you know, every study is a piece in the puzzle but it is still extremely difficult because still on a lot of these um, funding committees sit doctors who haven't learned about vitamin C in their, in their medical training and don't understand its functions or its importance. So it's up to us to you know, educate people, educate the doctors, um, publish and speak about it and you know, 
you know, it helps, but it is very difficult. And I, I'm, uh, last, I'm just going to push that to Dr. Traber. I mean, how, how hard is it to get people to care about vitamins? It's very difficult. I think uh, there's a certain cachet about uh, what is the latest fad, whether it's microbiome or even COVID-19. And I think to do basic studies that ask what is the best, what is the reason why we need vitamins, uh, we're still working on that. And the mechanisms are just amazing. You heard epigenetics just mentioned. I think people thought, well, that's only important for cell division. Well, it turns out all of regulation of cells is dependent on epigenetics. And vitamins are yeah. in there supporting how well does this work? And to not be able to get funding because somebody says, oh, we already know everything we need to know. And nobody is deficient in vitamin E or vitamin C or even zinc. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. Yep. And um, I'm, I'm worried about everybody's health. So I'll, I'll stop there and, yeah, and agree. I think we're we're going to have to stop there too. Um, so I'm going to actually ask, uh, thank every speaker for, for, for everything you've said and all the questions that you've answered. This has been a great talk. I uh, wish we could go on for another hour. Uh, but now I'm going to bring on uh, Dr. Ho one last time to close this out. Great, thank you. Um, a huge thank you to our expert panel, Dr. Carr, Drisco, Fowler, Dr. Traver, and our moderator, uh, Dr. Michaels. Um, a big thank you also goes out to the OSU Foundation, Andrew Norwood, um, and OSU Media Services, Nancy Shanks and Eric, who have been helping us on um, the back end. Um, again, thank you for all of you as well. Um, your passion for health is, is really apparent and um, trying to help answer your questions is something what uh, the LPI is really all about. Um, I know we weren't able to get to all the questions. We're still learning how to, how to um, you know, interact in this virtual world, but please reach out to our email um, uh, for more questions and we'll manage, uh, we'll send out some communications around recording of this and additional venues to be able to answer your questions. Um, just finally, if you liked our presentation today on vitamin C um, and appreciate our research uh, that really helps uncover all these keys to optimal health, um, please consider uh, making a donation in honor of Linus Pauling's birthday and Linus Pauling Day. Um, the links are here for you as well. We really appreciate your support um, in any way to, um, um, that you can, um, even if it's just, you know, we just want to hear from you um, and reach out to you as well. So. Have a great weekend uh, and remember to, to eat your fruits and vegetables and think about vitamin C. We'll see you soon.